This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to answer the question, has the Lightning Network failed? And this video is going to be a response to Jordan McKinney's video, which I'll link to in the description notes below, his video entitled Lightning Network Has Failed. I think it's a pretty well done video, but the title is a bit misleading. Jordan does not argue that the Lightning Network has already failed. Instead, Jordan makes the argument that the Lightning Network cannot scale Bitcoin to mass adoption because there's nowhere near enough block space on Bitcoin's base layer to open up the number of Lightning Network payment channels needed to service billions and billions of people. And Jordan argues that 99% of people will also not be able to use Layer 1, the base layer, either due to this same limited block space and the probably very high transaction fees. Layer 1 can only do about 158 million transactions per year when it comes to Bitcoin, which is clearly not enough to service 8 billion people on Layer 1, and also not enough to open up enough Lightning channels for 8 billion people. Because to open and close Lightning payment channels, you need to do a transaction on the base layer that either locks when you're opening up a Lightning payment channel or unlocks Bitcoin when you're closing a Lightning payment channel adding money to or withdrawing money from a payment channel as well, which is called splicing in or splicing out, also requires on-chain transactions, though Jordan in this video seems oddly unaware that splicing exists. He says at one point that you have to close a lightning payment channel if you run out of funds on one side of it. So this is the basic premise. If there's not enough room on-chain for everyone to transact, Jordan maintains, and if there's not enough room for everyone to open up a lightning payment channel, then most people will end up using custodial solutions. And then you have most people using, when you have most people using custodial solutions, it becomes impossible to enforce Bitcoin's 21 million max supply because you end up with a lot of paper Bitcoin. And in this way, at least according to Jordan, Bitcoin is doomed to lose its most important property of true scarcity and thus will fail. Not that it has failed, but that it will fail. Now, Jordan's video was made 11 months ago, so it's ironic that lately, in 2025, Bitcoin has had the opposite kind of problem, not base layer congestion and high fees, but rather half empty blocks and very low transaction fees. As we can see here 22 days ago, there are a couple blocks here that weren't even completely full blocks. So today you have people making the opposite argument from Jordan's, not that Bitcoin is going to be used to death, as Jordan argues, but rather that Bitcoin will fail because it's becoming a ghost town. This is what Jacob King says, Bitcoin is nothing more than a hollow Ponzi scheme. The network sees almost no transaction activity with countless blocks being mined empty, no real commerce, no real utility, no real demand, just endless hype and speculation. When the gamblers move on and it collapses into nothing. Well, Jacob, it has been about 16 years of quote unquote gambling and it's still the largest uh, digital asset in the world. So it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So which one is it? You have to make up your mind. Is Bitcoin going to die because it's getting too little usage? Or is Bitcoin going to die because it's getting too much usage? You can't have it both ways. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just pause really briefly here to ask you to help to support this channel's educational mission. Hit the subscribe button. That does really help with this channel's reach and engagement. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. We have the midwit meme here where on the left, the dummy saying Bitcoin fees are just right and the genius saying Bitcoin fees are just right on the right side. And then in the middle, we have the midwit saying Bitcoin fees are too low. The network is dying. Actually, now Bitcoin fees are too high. Pe poor people are being priced out of layer one. Actually, Bitcoin fees are too low again. Miners will go broke and transactions will be censored. Wait, they're too high again. So you have to decide which side you want to be on. Though Jordan does make some good points about Bitcoin scaling problems. And none of these concerns, to be clear, are a new thing. Concerns around Bitcoin being able to scale have been present from the very beginning. And I mean the very beginning. Satoshi published his white paper on Halloween on October 31st in 2008. And just three days later, James Donald posted this in the cryptography chat room in the forum. Uh, he responds, we're very, very, we very, very much need such a system, but the way I understand your proposal, it does not seem to scale to the required size. So scaling has been a concern since the very early days. Jordan is not the first person to make this kind of argument about block congestion and high fees. It's common sense that you can never create blocks big enough to hold all the global monetary transactions that take place daily, like that guy buying a cup of chai in New Delhi and that other guy buying a cup of coffee in Vienna and the billions and billions of people doing more than billions and billions of transactions daily. So it's crazy to think you'll ever be able to include every financial transaction made by 8 billion people 
in a blockchain. If you have giant blocks, you lose out on decentralization becomes, because it becomes too difficult and too technically difficult or too expensive for most people to run nodes and deal with highly complex and bloated blockchains. Ironically, given Jordan's love for Ethereum, which is apparent on his channel, this is the current state of Ethereum. No one runs full archival nodes, but rather they outsource node operation to large corporations like Infura. And when these large corporations have a problem, everything crawls to a halt as happened when Infura went down and then exchanges couldn't even uh, allow people to withdraw their ETH. So Jordan really likes how Ethereum scales using rollups, but I think here he misses the forest for the trees. It doesn't matter how Ethereum scales since its base layer is a complete joke. As we've talked about for years on this channel, Ethereum is built on a foundation of sand and Ethereum's troubled history includes a large pre-mine, a large insider allocation, forking the chain to protect Vitalik's buddies from the DAO hack, changing consensus mechanisms mid-flight, and base layer complexity that leads to one hack after another, like the Bybit hack, which just happened about two months ago. I made a video about this, talking about why your ETH is not safe anywhere now. ETH, Ethereum smart contracts are so complex that they're impossible to fully inspect or verify on the screen of a hardware wallet. And this is true at the corporate level, as the Bybit, sh the Bybit hack shows. When you sign an ETH transaction, you may be inadvertently putting into motion a smart contract that will steal your ETH. By contrast, Bitcoin possesses a much, a much more stripped down and hence more safe base layer that includes multi-sig, which ETH does not have. So it's always surprising when I see these videos like Jordan's other video, which argues that ETH has superior monetary policy. Uh, my response is, oh yes, a protocol that hard forks every few months and that changed its monetary policy seven years in, moving from a thermodynamically sound consensus mechanism like proof of work to a thermodynamically pathetic consensus mechanism like proof of stake. This is the protocol that you, Jordan, want to argue has more credible forward monetary policy. I don't think so. The foundation for good money needs to be secure and unchanging like Bitcoin, not erratic and mercurial and flaky like Ethereum. And Ethereum really did shoot itself in the foot by moving to proof of stake in September 2022 and has been dying ever since. This is a chart of ETH versus Bitcoin and ETH has been trending down and will continue to trend down forever. So I think getting back to Jordan's video, Jordan's main critique in his video is true that blockchains don't scale well due to limited block space and high layer one fees. This is widely agreed upon. But this critique applies to all blockchains, not just Bitcoin. Blockchains simply do not scale well on their own. And this is why you need to take a layered approach where higher layers take some of the burden off of the base layer, while the base layer is used for the most important, the most economically dense transactions. So the purpose of any layer two on Bitcoin or any other blockchain is to ease the burden on layer one by batching up and netting out transactions, and then later settling those economically dense settlement transactions on layer one. So here's how that would work with the Lightning Network. You'd open a payment, a Lightning payment channel with your partner. That's one transaction to open the, the, open the channel. It's a two of two multi-sig that needs to be opened up on the base layer, on layer one. Then you can do millions of transactions back and forth with your channel partner. And I'm simplifying here as well, since payment channels can connect with each other to route payments. So you don't just need to have one channel uh, partner, but then the various channels interconnect. So after, after opening a Lightning payment channel, you could do millions and millions of transactions basically for free back and forth. And then you can eventually settle the net results of those millions of transactions on Bitcoin layer one by either closing the channel or splicing funds out, and that requires another transaction on chain. So that's two economically dense transactions, either opening the channel, closing the channel, or opening the channel, and then splicing funds in or out. That's two economically dense transactions on the base layer. And because these transactions are economically dense, i.e. they contain the net results of millions of smaller transactions, as we said, the burden of paying a transaction fee on the base layer to close the channel is much less i.e. you'll be willing to pay a much higher transaction fee on the base layer than you would for smaller transactions like buying a cup of coffee using on-chain layer one Bitcoin. So Lightning is not a magic bullet, but it's still a really nice way to ease congestion on Bitcoin layer one on the base layer by moving millions of transactions, billions of transactions to layer two. Opening and closing channels or splicing funds in and out, as we said, still requires a transaction fee on the base layer, but that's true for Ethereum as well. Here's how these things always work. You pay a transaction fee on the base layer to lock up some money, either whether it's BTC or ETH, 
you lock up the money on layer one, and then you can use a representation or cryptographic representation of that locked up money on layer two. And this is how we ensure that the supply doesn't accidentally get doubled. You have to lock it up on the base layer to use it on a higher layer. So for example, on the liquid network, you lock up BTC on layer one, and then you receive liquid BTC, LBTC to use on the liquid network. It's true for lightning, as we said, you lock up BTC on layer one, and you receive lightning BTC to use on the lightning network. It's true for Ethereum rollups like Arbitrum, for example, where you lock up ETH on layer one and receive Arbitrum ETH on the Arbitrum network. So given that these things work the same way, would you prefer, prefer to use the strongest layer one in the world, Bitcoin, powered by proof of work, or would you prefer the Rube Goldberg machine that is Ethereum with its bloated base layer, its pre-mine, its weak consensus mechanism, its endless hard forks driven by a small group of insiders like Vitalik, etc. So Jordan is correct that custodial solutions will also play a role in scaling Bitcoin. But these custodians do not need to be bad actor Wall Street banks like JP Morgan or Goldman or what you think of when it comes to a bank. They can also be good actors, for example, example like River, which offers proof of reserves, thus mitigating Jordan's fears about custodians leading to lots of paper Bitcoin. When you use River, you can verify for yourself that they are holding enough Bitcoin to back all of their reserves and that they're holding enough Bitcoin, most importantly, to allow you to withdraw your Bitcoin if you need to. So this is these are good actor Bitcoin banks. Custodial solutions don't need to be large faceless Wall Street banks. They can also be smaller things like Fediments, which function a little bit like community banks run by people from your community that you already trust. And I'll put a link to this if you want to learn more about Fediments and how they work. Fediments combined with the Lightning Network really are a perfect way of easing on-chain congestion and helping to scale Bitcoin. So you can imagine many, many Fediments, many custodians, many Bitcoin banks all linked to each other like islands linked by, for example, shipping channels or electrical wires. They're all linked by the Lightning Network and then everything's settling on the base layer. So Bitcoin's future may look a little bit like that, like Bitcoiners transacting on-chain for large amounts plus lots of different custodians, including banks and fediments, all connected to each other over the Lightning Network, and then using Bitcoin's base layer for settling large, economically dense transactions that require the strong final settlement guarantees that come with base layer Bitcoin. What about doing a soft fork to add features to Bitcoin that will help it scale? This is something that Jordan ad advocates for in his video. The problem is that soft forks are really difficult to get people to agree to. It's not easy like it is with Ethereum where you've got a living founder who just leads you from one hard fork to another. Even doing soft forks is very difficult in Bitcoin. And then there's a problem of unknown unknowns. For example, SegWit and Taproot. This combination, though each one was good in itself, brought us inscriptions, runes, BRC20 tokens, and other garbage. And so I'll link to this video in the description notes below. Is your Bitcoin opcode, your software change, safe and effective? Obviously referring to the last four years of history as to something that was not safe and not effective. In this video, I discuss the risks, including unknown unknowns, that can come with making changes to Bitcoin's consensus rules. A given opcode can help Bitcoin to scale massively, but it could also introduce a fatal bug that destroys the network incentives. And so we have to be very careful moving forward doing software changes and taking this path in order to scale Bitcoin. It's something we have to proceed very slowly and very deliberately. And just because some devs want some new opcodes to play with, that's not reason enough. I believe Bitcoin can already scale quite well using things like custodians, banks, fediments, and the, the Lightning Network. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.